Well, oh, hello. Um, I realised the first slide should have been the name of the paper and the authors. I forgot that, but it's in your notes. But the Read very oh, small. it's at the very bottom. Yes. Yeah. So, Dead Mouse, Derek Bailey, and the laptop instrument. Um, and the authors are uh, me, Adam Parkinson, and uh, Rennick Bell. Rennick's been up since Rennick's jet lagged. He's been up since three thirty teaching his students in Japan over Skype. And he's from, he's from Texas, so his English isn't very good. So um, I'm going to do most of the talking, and, and Rennick will interject when, uh, you know, when necessary. But anyway, um, our thesis here is that um, Derek Bailey and Dead Mouse uh, provide us with very polar opposites to, to, to live music or to live performance. And it's really interesting to examine live coding in between these two, sort of, sort of thinking of a continuum from Derek Bailey to, uh, to Dead Mouse and, and, and how we place live coding on that continuum. And, uh, and I think that it reveals lots of um, assumptions that are often built into what we're doing that we don't properly examine about the instrument, about staging, um, and you know about what it means to experience music. Um, and so, why Dead Mouse and Derek Bailey? Um, so, like I said, they're polar opposites in their approaches to repeatability and predictability. Um, uh, Derek Bailey wants who's an improvising guitarist, I'll talk about him a bit more later on. Every Derek Bailey set is different. Derek Bailey, the last thing he wants is predictability or repeatability. Dead Mouse, he wants his set to be the same every time he plays. He was playing to thousands and thousands of people. He needs absolute predictability and repeatability. Um, and uh, by using Bailey, Derek Bailey, as a figurehead to represent a whole tradition of British free improvisation. There's a lot more people than just Derek Bailey who did free improvisation, but kind of, I think he is a, a useful person to use as a figurehead because he was very influential at the beginning and also he wrote about um, improvising and about thinking about improvising. So, um, in a way, I'll be referring to Bailey to refer to the whole of free improvisation. So there's, there's a lot of generalizations, but used to make useful points, hopefully. And why are we talking about Dead Mouse? Um, you know, whether you love him or hate him, he's hugely famous. And uh, this, again, might upset people, but musically and technologically, he's quite close to live coding. He's using similar tools like a laptop. He's using repetitive beats. And also, he's written a lot of very interesting things in his Tumblr um, about liveness, which are worth examining. So I think he's someone who's, uh, who's, who should be on our radar, um, even if you don't you know, like what he does or what he represents. Um, and also, this is in response partly to uh, criticism of the paper um, or of our proposal. Um, we're not just saying that live coding involves free improvisation, um, although it is worth saying that a lot of live coders will deliberately put themselves in positions where they have to improvise, and there's lots of improvisation in live coding. But what we're trying to say, um, rather than just that live coders improvise, is that the way that live coders use the laptop has a lot in common with the way in which uh, uh, many free improvisers approach their instrument, and that's the idea of it being this um, uh, a sound source, a very material sound source with very specific affordances that they're exploring through extended techniques and through different ways. And uh, yeah, I think that a lot of improvisers and a lot of live coders are taking a tool and using it in very unconventional ways and exploring a certain idea of instrumentality and virtuosity. Um, and uh, uh, also, um, I think that we want the paper to be useful for people outside of live coding and you know, to try and put live coding in a context of the, the dance music culture of Dead Mouse and the free improv, free improv culture of Derek Bailey. So anyway, Dead Mouse. I'm not going to play any Dead Mouse. Um, assume that most people are vaguely aware of him. He's very famous. He does shows. He wears a big mouse head, but he's not actually a mouse. Um, and uh, 
and he recently he um he published uh, a Tumblr called We All Hit Play, um, and uh, uh, yeah, um, and I think that what he does, he, he's he's got a very public assault on this rockist idea that live performance should be a guy on stage actually doing something, you know, hitting strings on a guitar, but Dead Mouse. That's not what he's about. And he wrote this long Tumblr, which we're going to show some excerpts from, saying, we all hit play. And I think it was very brave of him to admit it. So anyway, it begins with this. It's no secret. When it comes to live performance of EDM, and the, the slightly darker bit is our annotation, or whatever, the lighter bit is what he's actually saying. When it comes to live performance of EDM, that's about the most it seems you can do anyway. It's not about performance art, it's not about talent either, really it's not, in fact. Let me do you and the rest of the EDM world button pushes who fucking hate me for telling you how it is a favour and let you all know how it is. Um, yeah, we all hit play. Um, and Dead My Shows are a spectacle, and importantly, importantly, it's a reliable spectacle. So I'm not going to read out completely, but he's saying here he's got a computer, it's spewing out loads of stuff from Ableton, it's triggering lots of lights, and it's playing lots of stems of his original productions that he's created in the studio. Um, and he, he says it's redundant, but the important thing for him is it's reliable, it works when he's playing to... Um, you know, like, you know, thousands, I don't know, big crowds, bigger than I play to. Um, it's reliable, it doesn't break, uh, unlike my system. Um, and uh, and then, then this is when it starts to get really interesting. Dead Mouse, in this Tumblr post, he starts to say how he really doesn't care about this, uh, this rockist notion of virtuosity, um, and saying, you know, with one hour of tuition, with one hour of instru instruction, anyone with minimal knowledge of Ableton could do what he's doing. There's a good chunk of MIDI data spitting out, which he tweaks, but it doesn't give him a lot of in his phrases, look at me, I'm Jimi Hendrix, check out this solo stuff. And, you know, he's putting it very crudely, but he's, you know, he's against this kind of showing off virtuosic thing, and he's saying... I'm sick of hearing this. No, I'm not just doing this. I have six tables up there and I do this and this and this. You know, who cares? What does it matter what you're doing? The important thing for him is producing this spectacular live show that's reliable. Um, and he identifies his skills as existing in producing studio compositions. Um, and in that way, he's you know very close to the whole tape music, electroacoustic composition, um, you know, it's a tired old question, but we, you know, in you know, for centuries, no one ever tried to make composers themselves produce their work live. It's just, it's only nowadays that people have a laptop that we imagine there might be this all-in-one genius who can do these studio productions and then create it all live. And and Dead Mouse, he's saying, you know, his skills lie in doing it in the studio. The live show is something separate to that. Um, and uh, yeah, and continuing, he, he values the, the spectacle and the light show and the atmosphere. Um, and uh, I think you can probably get what he's saying from there. And, uh, and also he says, I'm not going to let it go thinking that people assume there's a guy in his laptop up there producing new original tracks on the fly because none of the top DJs in the world, to my knowledge, have. So, you know, I think... Obviously, he's not been to an Algorave because Algorave is all about the top DJs in the world producing <laughs> um, tracks on the fly. Um, and and, and it's, um, uh, in the arguments that came after this argument, he did link to a create digital musical argument, acknowledging lots of people who were doing stuff on the fly. But um, I think it doesn't take away from the, the main point that most people on Dead Mouse's kind of pay grade and with his audiences aren't doing stuff live, but a lot of them, maybe they're pretending. And here's a quite famous photo of the band Justice, who were um, sweating away, like, um, with, yes, the unplugged MPD. So perhaps it would be best if Justice just said, look, we've got good denim. We make good music. <laughs> we press play. What's the problem? Um, 
And anyway, now, so to try and move on quickly to Derek Bailey. So again, for people who don't know Derek Bailey, he was a Sheffield musician who in the 60s was responsible for creating what I think he called non-idiomatic music or free improvisation, which drew on the, um, the sort of free jazz of Ornette Coleman and a lot of kind of European avant-garde stuff and Stockhouse and, and tried to produce music that was outside of history, the idea of picking up an instrument and interacting with other, other musicians but not relying on any of the props of, of style or, you know, uh, chord structures or harmony or rhythm, doing something completely new every time you played. Um, and this was very much what Derek Bailey was about. And he wrote a book called Improvisation, which um, didn't just talk about free improvisation, but traced this whole history of people um, uh, improvising, basically. Um, and uh, I think that for Derek Bailey uh, has a lot in common with live coders in that he sees improvisation um, as this... Uh, exploring the musical affordances of different materials. For Derek Bailey, it was a guitar, um, but for live coders, it's, um, it's a computer and it's code. And it's looking at what is this, this what can this machine do? Um, uh, do you think we should move on to the next one? Um, yeah, and live coding, yeah, have you heard of this? I'm not gonna tell you what it is, um, but yeah. Um, but live coding has a lot in common with free improvisation because it's, we believe, and I guess in a way this is the point of the paper, that live coding treats the computer like an instrument. Very specifically in terms of projecting on a screen what you're doing um, and, uh, and building on predictability into your sets um, and uh, trying to let the audience see what you're doing. And just very, very briefly, and this is we go into this more in the paper just to say that live coding isn't the only people to be improvising with computers there's a whole history um in particular people like george lewis and groups like the hub who have improvised with computers and you could look at our paper and look at the references in that and i'm sure that you could all find out more about that but just to say live coding wasn't the first but anyway live coders realize that the um, I think that, yeah, in projecting the screen, there's almost something of showing the guitarist fingers on the fretboard within live coding, um, that live coders realise that the interesting gestures and things that happen on a computer, it's often not kind of sensors and things like that, but it's these interactions between uh, human beings and code. Um, and uh, in a way, that allows for kind of manifestations of virtuosity, which actually put live coding far more in line with the kind of rockish tradition of guitar soloists. So here we have um, guitar soloist Rennick Bell next to some uh, uh, live coder or something. Um, and, uh, um, and I think uh, there was a very interesting essay written by Francisco Lopez called Against the Stage. And Francisco Lopez is very interested in trying to get beyond this kind of uh, maybe 19th century, um, I get them confused, tradition of putting musicians on a stage and expecting them to do something. And he has these things where he blindfolds people and plays sounds them and does things like that. Whereas I think that within um, live coding, it's quite traditional, at least compared to Francisco Lopez, in that they put a musician on the stage, but they've just figured out a way of, you know, we know, they, we know they're not checking their email. It's a way of exposing the instrumentality of the laptop and presenting the laptop as an instrument to the audience. Um, and it allows for a kind of focus on spectacle. Um, and uh, again, just, just to... Um, draw more parallels between live coding and free improvisation. I think that there's, um, uh, there's a lot of ways in which the live coder, um, well, a free improviser, a free, improviser, free improviser will often use extended technique to explore the very limits of their, what they're playing, whether it's the kind of circular breathing of a sax player like Evan Parker, 
or people uh, you know putting uh, Keith Rowe laying his guitar down flat, sticking things under the strings, live coders are, you know putting together their own coding libraries and things like that. I think there's there's again there's kind of more parallels um, uh, in basically exploring the affordances, the musical affordances of certain materials. So, the, but the other point here was that so the idea is that the live coder is doing composition, some kind of compositional activity live, whereas Dead Mouse says all of his compositional mm. activity takes place in his fancy modular studio. Yeah, and and Dead Mouse in doing so belongs to a, a tradition that goes back to tape music, electroacoustic music, George Martin and the Beatles, Brian Eno, you know, non real assembling music in the studio in non real time is. A, a very long tradition and this sudden idea that they should do it live perhaps that's something that we should abandon or at least redress um and uh, and here we have a picture of this alex mclean guy uh, um actually improvising with a drummer uh, paul hessian and in the last session we saw i don't know how much was improvised but we saw these kind of blends of live coders working with um uh uh at least live musicians are free improvisers. And I think it's interesting that we're getting to this situation where people are really exploring how the computer can be used as an instrument. Okay. So the, the last thing that leaves then is this bit about uh, theat theatricality. And uh, so if, if we say that there's Dead Mouse and he's all about theater and then live coders, many live coders are about composition, maybe in fact there's a lot of live coding that can also be theater. So if it's not a continuum, maybe there's even like two parameters, a theatrical parameter and a compositional parameter, something like that in a live coding performance. So yeah. you have something like Robert Henke doing this uh, kind of putting code on a, on a screen, totally scripted, but it's just, it's just theater. Yeah, and I think uh, Ryoji Ikeda is almost moving towards that as well, maybe, and it's, uh, um, but, um, so yeah. Conclusion, <laughs> um, Dead Mouse and Derek Bailey, um, uh, yeah, um, Dead Mouse is interested in predictability and he uses a computer as a studio, st a studio tool to create compositions. Bailey uses the guitar as something that's going to be different every time and live coding predominantly is like Derek Bailey is using the laptop as this live instrument, exploring its affordances um, unique musical affordances, um, uh, despite coming from the Dan tradition of Dead Mouse, but in some ways, kind of almost drawing on this musicians on a stage uh, tradition that's quite old in some ways. Um, that was a kind of ramble through the slides, but hopefully that there'll be some questions that that raised. We hope anyway, but I don't know whether we're going on to them straight away yeah. or. So let's thank Um, I, I, I would say that the definition of where the instrument is is a, a complex one, and it definitely involves, and, and I think that laptops problematize that, like the, the, the and create these blurred boundaries of the instrument, and I, not really fully investigating that. But I like to t talk about the laptop instrument, and I like to refer to the hardware and the software. And I think live coding is interesting because it often just uses the keyboard you know, the hardware and then software running on it. So it really is just the laptop being an instrument rather than the laptop and some sensors or a MIDI controller. In many cases, it is just the laptop instrument. But yeah. have you got something to... Yeah, it's, it's the, the laptop is a symbol for all those parts, oh. right? So, yeah, we, I, don't, I don't disagree with the software part at all. Mm. Okay, so, sorry, we just have time for one question from each speaker. Yeah. Uh, but we'll thank them again. Right. And Thanks. Thank you. Let me immediately introduce Emma Cocker, who's going to deliver our next paper. Sorry.
Okay, I feel a bit old school with my piece of paper here, but hey. Um, okay, so this paper um, draws on an experience as a critical interlocutor or a writer, really, within two AHRC digital transformation projects. Um, weaving Codes, Coving Weaves, which is led, as you perhaps know, by Alex um, in dialogue with Alan Harlesius Kluck, and a previous project called Live Notation, Transforming Matters of Performance, which was uh, led by Alex with Hester Reeve, who's also here. So in this paper, what I want to do is propose potential points of connection between ancient weaving and live coding, considering both practices through the prism of the ancient Greek concept of techne, a species of tactical knowledge combining the principles of metis, or cunning intelligence, and kairos, or opportune timing. So making a return to how the term was used in ancient Greek culture, I'm interested in techne as a disruptive or even subversive species of knowledge capable of dealing with contingent situations whilst fully harnessing their capricious force, a knowledge capable of seizing the potential of chance, randomness and indeterminacy, whilst at the same time converting this to unexpected direction. So this inquiry specifically addresses the human qualities of attention, cognitive agility and tactical intelligence activated within both live coding and live weaving, arguing that such practices might have the potential for cultivating a more critical mode of human agency and subjectivity. So the connections I want to excavate are less directly to do with the shared technology, computer and loom, nor shared notational systems, pattern and code, nor mathematical algorithms, or even the relationship between the resulting weaves, whether digital or textile. Instead, my approach is one of attending to what is inter, focusing on the capacities, the knowledges, and the qualities of attention emerging in between the disciplinary lines through the relation or negotiation between human and machine, to the live embodied process of decision making involved in both weaving and coding, which I would argue that many notational systems seem arguably unable to fully account for. So I ask, what knowledges and capacities have become lost or devalued through the privileging of speed, productivity, economic efficiency and the standardisation that certain technological developments bring? Um, and the project in particular looks to the jacquard loom, which is often the connection between weaving and coding, and asks, what if there was a different history? Um, what if a relation between ancient uh, weaving and live coding could be struck? So indeed, there are certain technologies that actively create the conditions of ignorance or alienation, where, as I demonstrate, a technology has the capacity to be used or operated in the, in the absence of any knowledge of underpinning process, principles or structures. So really, I suppose what I'm interested in is this question. Can the questioning of standards and templates, which I think live coding particularly epitomizes, alongside an increased awareness of underpinning structures and causes within one context, facilitate the same in other aspects of life? So this revelation and live reworking of digital code through performance in live coding involves showing and sharing the unfolding logic of a language so instrumental to contemporary life, but, but in which so few are fluent. And we're sort of familiar with the idea of code or be coded, write or be written, weave or be woven. The live coding and ancient we weaving practices that I've encountered within the Weaving Codes, Coding Weaves projects invite a much more complex, nuanced, or even entangled human-machine relation where technology is not so much put to use as worked with. The process unfolding through attending to, even collaborating with, the resistance exerted by the technology or apparatus, rather than simply conceiving it as a tool that needs to be brought under control or mastered. So as we've heard, a process of improvisatory working emerges through creating the right tension, cultivating an understanding of tolerance, how far something can be pushed or pressured before it breaks, indeed, when to instill breaks or rests. Both live coding and ancient weaving foreground understanding of process and structure. Understanding is cultivated through use and experiment, through trial and error, by doing something as a way of knowing how it is done, moreover, for knowing how it might be changed, swerved, or taken in a different direction. 
or rather understanding is cultivated through an oscillation or even shuttling between discontinuous systems of abstract notation and the continuous experience of the lived process. Or actually, I think today one of the things I was interested in is a kind of shuttling between the present and the future present, which the life coder seems to be doing. Um, so this kind of shuttling between two different experiences feels quite pivotal. So I ask, what are the cognitive and bodily ex intelligences operating in the lived space between the continuous and the discontinuous, between the abstract and the lived, or perhaps even between the, f uh, the present and the future present? Knowledge gained through experiment might take the form of doing and undoing, the repeated labour of trying something out over and over, a kind of tacit knowledge cultivated through the accumulation of tests and attempts. Here, repetition might be undertaken less towards the perfection of a given move or manoeuvre, but rather towards the building of confidence and capacity, a working knowledge of process or material such that it becomes ingrained in mind and muscle, activated at the fingertips, and in the process of thinking on act, live and, live and emergent to the situation rather than pre-planned in advance. Or else here, perhaps less a tacit kind of knowledge or of a know-how, but rather a form of knowing, closer to the imminent intensification of thinking that philosopher Alan Badiou, following Nietzsche, asserts, is not affected anywhere else than when it is given. Thought is effective in situ. It is, what is, it is what is intensified upon itself, or again, it is the movement of its own intensity. Not a knowledge, then, that is easily banked and transferable, but rather acquired through practice, moreover, activated only in and through practice. A tactical knowledge performed through receptivity to the possibilities of the unfolding situation. So for the ancient Greeks, the term metis describes a form of wily intelligence capable of seizing the opportunities or kairos made momentarily visible as the prevailing logic within a given structure or system yields. Metis is the art of preparing for what, not, for what could not have been planned for in advance. And it's the same skill that's used as in catching the force of the wind or the turn of the tide. Um, and elsewhere I've been trying to conceptualise this as something that I call helmsman's knowledge or the knowledge of sailing. Marcel Detien and Jean-Pierre Venant note that this is as prompt as the opportunity that it must seize on the wing, not allowing it to pass. Reflecting on its role in ancient Greek rhetoric, Detien and Venant describe Metis as a type of intelligence and of thought, a way of knowing. It implies a complex but very coherent bod body of mental attitudes and intellectual behaviour which combine flair, wisdom, forethought, subtlety of mind, deception, resourcefulness, vigilance and opportunism. It is applied to situations which are transient, shifting, disconcerting and ambiguous. So they're talking about kind of an ancient Greek knowledge, but my application would be that this describes, it would seem very well, the idea of life coding practice. So to improvise within a shifting situation requires skillfulness and attention, a capacity for biding one's time and knowing when to act. Within many life coding practices, the audience encounters projected code as a running command line whilst it is being modified or rewritten by the programmer and even in some instances by the code or interpreting system itself. Here then, rules or instructions, rules or instructions are not to be diligently followed but rather have the capacity to be modified or adapted even as they are being executed. The tension of an unfolding thread or code varied as it is being woven or written or else undone and rewoven, enabling the possibility of a change of tack. The live running code makes manifest a developing logic based on the principles of what if, through the testing of the possibility of this or this or this or this. What then is the specificity of this thinking and action activated whilst improvising within the live running code? And how might it relate to working on the loom to a kind of loom thinking? Indeed, the means through which the same result is arrived at can create quite different kinds of knowledge, quite different kinds of hu human capacities. So rather than through the unfolding of trial or error, the generative testing of this or this or this or this, knowledge might also be acquired through an inversion of a given process. Here, undoing com comes first, 
a reverse engineering of a weave or code necessary for seeing its underpinning structure, not only the surface pattern, an active undoing then for knowing how something works or is structured, for seeing beyond the surface of things, acts of appropriation, of hacking and backtracking as a means of taking back control, or no, rather resisting control, for reasserting the potential for creative improvisation within a seemingly standardised process, for recuperating human agency within systems whose options seem increasingly closed or, prohibit or prohibitive, form of creative consumption, to follow Michel de Certo, or the cultivation of a minor language or practice, to draw on Deleuze or Guattari, where the prescribed codes and patterns of the dominant culture are appropriated or hacked, modified or inverted, creatively re reverse engineered, and then redirected towards other often, yes, often less utilitarian ends. Here then, existing patterns, rules or codes are not to be taken as a given, as fixed or unchangeable, but rather appropriated as a found material within which to work or rework. The process of coding or weaving in these terms is not conceived as an algorithmic operation whose logic is simply imported and set in motion, allowed to run its course, rather both have the capacity to be unraveled and rewritten as events unfold. I'm reminded of Penelope, wily weaver of ancient myth, wife of Odysseus in Homer's Odyssey, weaving by day and unweaving by night, willfully unraveling the weave such that by morning the task might begin again. Hers is an act of unweaving and reweaving to avoid the completion of a task, for refusing the teleology of outcome or of commodity, the production of a, project, a product and its consequences. For the contemporary life coder, might not the Penelopean logic of doing and undoing, or even undoing and redoing, also be harnessed as a kind of active resistance, conceived as an attempt to thwart or subvert the capture by capital, refusing the terms of easy assimilation, the undoing of the logic of a given accepted model or concept might be performed in order for it to be reworked or modified, or else code is woven only to be unravelled, for making tangible the process of decision-making. Doing and undoing, undoing and redoing, performed as a mode of deviation or subversion of purposefully non-productive labour. Weaving and unweaving of both code and thread operate as an open-ended process, not so much concerned with the not so much concerned with the production of product as experience, yet what other meanings and capacities, if not products, might be produced there. I think of Lucy Arigare when she says, one must listen differently in order to hear another meaning, which is constantly in the process of weaving itself, at the same time ceaselessly embracing words and yet casting them off in order to be in order to avoid becoming fixed or immobilized. What kinds of performativity, what politics, what philosophies, what poetics emerge therein? Repetition of a process as training, or as exercise, or as ascesis even. Ascesis, a preparatory training or reflexive exercise connected to the cultivation of techne. Could live coding and live weaving be conceived as ascesis for practicing or testing the art of timing or of timeliness? a capacity for responding to a new situation as it unfolds, attending to the gaps and deciding how to act. In one sense, both live coding and weaving can be considered as chirotic practices based on the principles of invention and intervention in the middle. Kairos is an ancient Greek term that means an opportune or fleeting moment whose potential must be grasped before it passes. It describes a qualitatively different mode of time to that of linear or chronological time it is not an abstract measure of time passing, but of time ready to be seized, an expression of timeliness, a critical junction or right time when something could happen. As Eric Charles White states, Kairos stands for a radical principle of occasionality, which implies a conception of the production of meaning in language as a process of continuous adjustment to and creation of the present moment. White states, Kairos is a will to have a will to invent, a form of improvisation, an adaptation to an always mutating situation. Understood as a principle of, inv of invention, Kairos ca counsels thought to act always as it were on the spur of the moment, or perhaps in live coding terms, through a process of coding on the fly. As Nick Collins and colleagues argue, live coders work with programming languages, building their own custom software, tweaking or writing the programs themselves as they perform. 
code is written as it is performed, a practice often referred to as coding on the fly or just-in-time coding, or what I would provisionally call chirotic coding. So I'm just going to skim a bit. Um, the twin, the, so basically, the twin pr uh, principles of Metis and Kairos is what I'm trying to investigate in relation to live coding. Um, using the prism of this ancient knowledge or techne as a different kind of epistemological framework for addressing key questions of liveness, dexterity, and decision-making within live coding as a practice. I think the key thing to say is that what I'm interested is in these practices that require a specific quality of alertness or attentiveness to the live circumstances or occasionality of their own production. And what I'm trying to do in my research is suggest that these actually might be related to the productions of certain kinds of subjectivity. And in that sense, this work connects with the uh, late work of Michel Foucault, especially around his notions of care of the self and the concept of making life in, into a work of art. In short, time pressing. Perhaps I leave on this question. How might weaving and coding be practiced as exercises or even ascesis as potential practices of the self? Um, so it's perhaps important to state that it's a kind of a proposition, really. Um, my background is in fine art, not coding and not weaving. So I kind of come into this as a bit of an interloper in a way. Um, the project's still in its early days. And I think the plan is to try and flesh it out with more of the technicalities that come from both the disciplines of weaving and live coding. Um, so if anyone is interested in this terrain, I'd be very interested in future conversations. Thank you. different readings of Penelope. I think historically she's often been imagined as a figure of fidelity um, and, and fidelity to Odysseus and a kind of a figure of, of the wife's loyalty. Um, there are a number of feminist read readings of this myth, as you might imagine, um, that suggest a more subversive resistance within her gesture. Um, so actually less, less a gesture of lo loyalty and perhaps one of independence and refusal. Um, but I think that idea of, um, there's, a, there's a very nice book <laughs> whose title has slipped my mind, where the Penelope and logic of doing and undoing is um, approached very much through the prism of feminist writing, particularly French feminist writing, by people like Irigure and Sixou. And I think there's something about that that actually, strange as it may seem to an audience such as this, looking at the male faces, um, there's something quite feminist, I would say, about live coding in the sense that it takes quite a patriarchal vocabulary and unders it and actually reweaves it into different kinds of working um, syntax. Um, so there's something there that I think could be really productively unpicked. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, on to our last speaker, this is Giovanni Mori. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, in my paper, oh, sorry, I have lost the first page. Um, in my paper, I present the result of my research at its second year. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Florence. Uh, this research aims at analyzing the live coding experience through the ma magnifying lens of ethnography. Uh, let me first introduce briefly what ethnography is and which ethnographical techniques I have been using during the research. Ethnography is a method uh, with the purpose of analyzing various kinds of cultural manifestations. Uh, through first-person perspective. Many inquiry techniques are employed during the research on the field. Ethnography has three main as assumptions. The first one is uh, a direct observation by the researcher. 
The second is because of this direct observation, the research perspective is that of the person who conducts it. And third, this perspe perspective is full of theory, or better, full of researcher cultural baggage. Ethnography is a constellation of techniques. Uh, in my research, I choose to employ two of them particularly, participative observation and ethnography. Uh, participati participative observation consists in both direct and active researcher participation in a particular cu cultural activity. The participation should last <coughs> for a sufficiently long period where the, the event uh, or the cultural manifestation in general is taking place. The ethnographer uh, interacts directly with participants and the interaction helps to build his or her knowledge of the milieu. The researcher should stay as close as possible to the community under investigation, although he or she has to maintain an equilibrium between the internal member's perspective and the researcher's one. Netnography instead is a branch of ethnography developed by uh, a, a person called Robert Kozinets, where the research field is the internet. Netnography is born in the market research field, but is widely used in sociology too. Uh, this kind of research practice helps to collect first-hand information from the spontaneous online users chatting. Then it enables the researcher to observe the field, uh, in brackets, from an external point of view, avo avoiding uh, unwanted perturbations. Uh, as a result, the researcher is able to collect data that are more objective. Ethnography is also a process of documentation. In fact, during the res their research, ethnographers try to catch the deep meaning of cultural manifestation under Inquisition and to channel it on the recorded support. Uh, this process is never easy nor transparent because, uh, because of the different constraints and features of every recording support. Then, every context needs particular documenting te techniques and to think about the effects of recording technology. In my case, for example, I choose to use a little and handy video recorder with hi-fi stere stereo microphones. I made this decision because I need an affordable and not too visible means of recording. I want to avoid that the audience feels under inquisition and to be felt as part of it. Uh, I need that people behave as much as possible in a natural way. After this brief introduction, I would speak of my research results in more details. First, I will try to define loosely what live coding is, in my opinion. <coughs> live coding, in my opinion, is a, a music technique and not a genre, a music genre broad. This last term uh, is, is, uh, addresses to a group of music compositions that share some features as form, compositional rules, architecture, instrumentation, and so on. The term live coding instead refers uh, to a way of producing music. It is improvised programming uh, acted mainly during live performances, both with the lively presence of the performer and not. Then, uh, with live coding, it is possible to produce many different musical genres. Uh, the most important aspect of live coding is that it enables the performer to build the music heard by the listener in, in real time. However, this term is sometimes used to address also a musical genre that is not very homogeneous, however. The most important constant aspect inside this genre is the computer screen projection. Uh, I choose to consider par particularly this example of live coding because, thanks to these characteristics, the cultural and musical processes are more evident and easier to understand, and because it groups around it a conspicuous number of artists. 
Music is the main cultural domain where live coding is employed, but it can be used also in many other cultural practices as, the, as dance performances, is image processing and even weaving. Uh, this improvising technique in music is characterized by real-time processing, uh, sound processing, sorry. This action is conducted through the employment of musical instruction and algorithms written in a high-level programming language, visualized pri principally by a textual interface. However, different interfaces may be employed as, for example, physical devices. Uh, nevertheless, uh, even in these last cases, the text plays a central role during the performance because, of, because it represents the sound result. Uh, all these aspects is clearly perceived uh, by the audience through an original artifice, the, so the just mentioned performer computer screen projection. Uh, where the concert take place. Uh, this feature is central in live coding events, aesthetic and purposes. Uh, it represents the ongoing developing of artists' musical thoughts and demonstrate that, that actions are driven by the human performer and not by the computer automatically. This trait is crucial because it adds tra transparency in computer music field. This case appears to be unique because it enables the listener to experience and confirm a live liveness effect. This is an important in innovation for computer music because for the first time programming becomes performative. The audience, ex the audience experience the performativity principally through screen projection. Uh, another, as another aspect that is worth to mention is the proximity between live coding performers and, and theorists and the, <coughs> and the hackers mov movement. I have to confess that I have not analyzed with the right accuracy this aspect yet, but it's for a fruit fruitful developments. And uh, I promise to, to develop it uh, in the future because I'm in the second year. <laughs> uh, Acker's mov movement is multifaceted, but it lays on some common princi principles. Among the most important, there are, one, the right of every person to modify freely and unlimitedly, unlimitedly every piece of software that is, that is on his or her computer. Second, the sharing of knowledge between members in a collaborative way. These rules seem to be respected in the live coding domain too. In fact, the most important programs are released under open source licenses and are very often uh, developed by a group of passionate programmers. Uh, additionally, there seems to be a strong community feeling that is expressed through many online forums, websites, and social network discussions. Probably, live coders are more close to the Raymond side than to the Stallman side, uh, the, the two groups uh, uh, that uh, the um, hacker community is divided because they do not demonize proprietary software and many of them use Apple computers or Windows computers. These two hackers represent the two main, main groups, uh, St Stallman and Raymond, uh, uh, represent the two main groups in which the movement is divided. Stallman is the champion of free software, uh, where the hybridization with pr the proprietary one is not accepted. Uh, another important aspect in live coding is the performer's role in the event dynamic. dynamic. Ha I have stated that this technique enables the performer to be perceived as, as a live entity who plays his, <coughs> his or her instrument real time. However, listener's attention seems to be attracted more by the screen projection than by the musician itself. 
Many times I have found myself staring at the, dime, the light beam, watching the evolving code on the screen instead of checking the performer musical actions. It seems, yeah, it seems that the screen projection has become, in this case, the real musical referent during the performance, because it is there that musical actions happen. This fact is confirmed by online performances. Uh, I have attended to a concert held at Network Music Festival last year in Birmingham, where three performers met on an online server and interacted to produce the sound heard in the music hall. Uh, even though the musicians were not present flesh and blood, the liveness effect, effect remained safe and untouched. That is probably due to the screen projection that acts, acts at, uh, as the performer's referent. The, the performer's musical thoughts is not represented through his or her body and actions, but uh, they are dematerialized and transformed in the light beam of the projector. The last aspect, aspect I have analyzed in my paper is the relationship between live coding and academia. I have explained how some live coders perceive a harsh conflict between dance music that can be easily heard in live coding events and academic, uh, academic music, even though they share some common characteristics. On the base of this statement, I explain that, in my opinion, live coding has a technique born in academic context but employed in many different performing fields could become a bridge between dance music and academia. This bridge has to be constructed still, uh, and the analysis of the shared characteristic or differences between these two repertoire, repertoires uh, when they are played through live coding can help in doing this. Ethnography is an important tool to analyze cultural manifestations that are not static and formalized. Live coding is a young repertoire without strong rules and definitions. Then an ethnographical approach can help in clarifying many movement internal dynamics. To conclude, I would state that this kind of approach might raise some important issues to give an identity to his multifaceted technique. It enables the researcher to collect important information about the audience performer interaction uh, during concert and to know and understand better the community internal dynamics. With this data, it is, it is possible to compare live coding and the respective repertoire with, the other music, with other music experiences. This comparison can help to, legitima to legitimate live coding in the computer music field. Thank you for your attention. I perceive uh, this life liveness effect, but also the audience present in the music hall because uh, uh, they react to stimuli given by the performer on the screen. For example, um, performers sometimes type messages uh, between them, and uh, people laugh to to them and applauded uh, when uh, when they finished. For example as uh, in the same way uh, as the, the performer were in, uh, in the music hall. So I, I, I think I, I have not interviewed the, the audience members, but uh, in my opinion, they also perceive this liveliness effect. So. Okay, thank you, so thank you very much. Again.